these are all powerhouses. There is no way that I would ever try to introduce them myself. So I would love each of you to just spend a few minutes telling this crowd who you are. And I would love for you to tell us a little something in life, just one thing that gives you purpose. Just a quickie from each of you. Start, we will start with the young man well, at the I'm end. A, I'm gonna tell you right now, Mama Wright would not let the, me go in front of these three women, so we're not, it's not happening. Oh, so oh I, I, I see, you're already, he's already directing me. Right. He's already telling right. me what he wants to do. Right. All right, so we're gonna leave you at the end, Navarro. Let's start over here. Well, good afternoon. My name is Gina Scott, and I lead partnerships at the NFL Players Association, and I am on the for-profit side, NFL Players Incorporated. Um, briefly, um, I started my career in college sports, so I've been all over the sports industry. Uh, collegiate sports, I've worked on the NBA side with the Atlanta Hawks, I've been in corporate sports marketing uh, with Delta Airlines, and then I've been on the league and the agency side negotiating a host of deals for Fortune 500 companies. Um, I am so happy and excited to be here today. And let's see, what gives me purpose? I'm gonna keep it to my day job, and it is working with our over uh, 2,300 players and their families to help them make a difference in their community. And what's something that gives you purpose? Like, what do you get up for every morning? I get up for my family and for my friends and to have total peace and high quality of life. I love that. Yeah. I can't argue with that. Go ahead, Liz. Hi, um, my name is Elizabeth Campbell. I work in uh, marketing for McDonald's and I lead our field team as well as our local culture team. So I'm accountable for about $60 billion worth of business that goes through the McDonald's system. Um, pennies. Pen just pennies. 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 Yes. Um, and so one of the things that gives me purpose is that as a kid, my mom always put me in front of strong black women. My mom did not have her high school diploma until she was in her 60s. But she put me in front of strong black women at a very young age because she was, she was putting me in front of people that could give me something that she couldn't at that time from a business perspective. So now that I'm in corporate America, I like to make sure that I'm giving back to the next generation. So honestly, what really gives me pur purpose is making sure that I'm pouring into the generation that's coming after me because my mom did that for me and I wanna make sure that I'm serving that back up to other people. I love that. Hey, Trace. Hey, hey, uh, my name is Tracy Sturdivant. I'm the president and CEO of The League. No, not the dating app, The League. <laughs> We're actually, I, I get that all the time. It's a great conversation starter. Uh, we are a social impact collective. We do work both at the intersection of nonprofit world and agency, so we get the, both, uh, the best of both worlds. Um, our work really is about helping people lead a civic lifestyle. So we may work with your favorite brands like Disney around content around the Little Mermaid, or we may work with community-based organizations who are trying to get people to vote. So it really runs the gamut um, of the type of work that we get an opportunity to do. We like to say that culture is where people are, well, politics is where people are some of the time, culture is where they are all of the time, so we really work at those uh, two intersections. Uh, what gets me up in the morning? My seven-year-old, very early uh, in the morning. Uh, I've done a lot of work around trying to encourage more people to be civically involved or get more women into elective office. But having a little black boy has like changed my worldview in a little bit because there's not a lot of space, not a lot of things specifically directed towards him and his ability to like thrive in the world. So just really him. <laughs> him. I love it. Do you deign to grace us? I'll give it a you shot. Well, I'll give you it a ready shot. now? I mean, I don't want to be the moderator and ask you to do things uh, or anything, Navarro. It's your world. I'm just a squirrel. I'm going to give it a shot. Navarro Wright, I am the Chief Operating and Chief Technology Officer for Mira Digital. For the past 12 years, Mira Digital has been serving multicultural creators and publishers, connecting them to brands and agencies to create long-lasting, effective media campaigns. Uh, I have been in this industry for about 30 years. Um, I've worked everywhere from BET to Radio One. I am a two-day jet internship away from working at every black media company in the universe. So if anybody can get me a two-day internship at Jet, I'd lovely take it. Um, just two days? Two days. Okay, I don't want to be there long. I just need that. the credit. I just need the credit. Um, so really excited to be here today. What, what motivates me is what's been motivating me over the last 30 plus years of being in this business is really leveling up multiculturals in this digital media space. I think even being here in 2024, I need to see more of us in many places except club quarantine tomorrow night. 
Um, so I'm trying to push for that to allow us to be effective business owners and in my children and family. Um, you know, I have three children who are all in college right now and these tuitions aren't gonna pay themselves. So I'm trying to get some of that $80 billion McDonald money flowing over <laughs> to Mirror Digital. So really excited to be well, here. Well, thank you. Okay, so today we're talking about the power of kind of like you have peanut butter and jelly or you have, I don't know, in my world, Louis and Vuitton. <laughs> We're talking about the collective power of social change and athletes and what that means. And so I think you'll begin to see as we create a narrative today of a conversation, how each of these folks have a stake in that conversation. It can really take us on the journey of understanding what it is, why it is, and why it's so important. So. With that, I'm gonna start with you, Gina. Gina, Gina, Gina. Um, you know, it's important to shape perspectives at the beginning, right? And a very popular sports figure, unnamed, once said, I am not a role model. And that's his prerogative, but in a world where over 60% of the population is on social media, following all of these athletes' actions, and they have some of the most recognized names on earth, I mean, we do have to begin to stop and think, where's the balance and that responsibility? So I guess the question for me that I want to ask you is, what do we owe them, right? What, as someone who's been entrusted with their care, what do we owe the athlete? Not what do we owe the folks on social media, but what do we, because that's, that's a lot to carry on your shoulder. So you almost understand why it was said, but can we abide by it? You can understand something, but can you abide by it? And Gina, you have that strong responsibility of helping them get there. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I don't know if I've ever heard it posed that way, right? And it really makes you think, and I would say, we owe the athlete a chance to listen to them. And I think that um, in our industry, uh, it's a one-way street usually. Everyone wants something from the athlete. They want them to perform well on the field. They want them to win. They want them to be those role models. But very rarely do we see the fans, the consumers, the non-athletes giving an athlete a chance to really be himself or herself. I think that when we reach, our country reached those tumultuous times four years ago at the height, because it's certainly not over, I think that consumers started to look at at least our players in a different light. And we know the quotes out there, just shut up and play basketball, just shut up and play football. And that was very telling. And that's what I said crystallized the, the point that most people didn't think it was a two-way street. They want everything, but they don't, didn't really want to give athletes a chance to be themselves and to develop their own platforms and to be who they really are off of the field and off of the court. Mm. So a chance to listen. And just poke at that for two seconds yeah. in your role you spend a lot of time Absolutely. listening don't you we because do. i i, I want to poke a little yeah. because your role is so unique if someone yeah. sat here you said well i'm chief counsel mm -hmm. she's a lawyer you know yeah. i'm head physician she's a doctor yeah. I, I i would love to poke at it yeah. because you really are you're a sociologist you're an anthropologist you're a psychologist yeah, Can you dig a little, yeah. because it's so intriguing to me what you do yeah. and how daily even you engage with those athletes Absolutely. and support them. So in our world, um, we are the players union. However, the side of the business that I work on, we're a licensing agency. So we look at ourselves just like the McDonald's and the Disney's of the world. Our sole focus is to make money for players off the field, mm. whether that's monetizing their brands, um, matching them with the right companies out there, um, creating those relationships. So you're absolutely right. We have to not only know our athletes, we have to know every single thing that makes them tick and every single thing that makes them marketable to brands. And so 
again, we listen to them with over 2,300 players, active players, that does not include our entire membership. We have 2,300 different opinions. So as an organization, we are not a B2B brand. We are not a B2C brand. Our membership is our focus. So when we talk about what issue are we going to champion, we can't pick three issues because we might have 2,300 issues. Right. We might pick the ones that rise to the top. And as an association, when we're looking to commercialize those relationships and monetize, we may go with the majority. But when you're dealing with a common denominator that large, Every single player wants to be heard, and every single player wants to be unique. They do not want to be compared with other players on their roster, other players on their conference. When we are talking to our players, it is all about them and only them. Wow. All right. Now, and that's a wonderful segue, because when we think about, you know, again, we're building a story here, and we're, we're building the story about how the social cause, social communication, athletes and brands. We've talked about the athlete. But let's talk about the brand. Let's talk about that brand. And Liz, you know, you and I have talked, we've worked together for a while. We've talked about this many times that some people think it's easy. Brand plus talent equals success. And it really is not. Now, I'm not saying it's brain surgery. It might be close, but it is not quite brain surgery. But there is really something to it. And, and to be able to find that right balance to find an organic an authentic relationship between the two, especially when you got 2,300 different conversations happening. So Liz, what I wanna to talk to you about is can you, you know, talk to us a little bit from your perspective about what best process points are as you take that journey, as you're thinking about trying to make that marriage happen between your brand and an athlete? Yep, I love the question. Um, one of the things, and you said it, you said talent. One of the things that we do is that we don't look at people we're partnering with as talent. We look at them as partners. Like you've got to be a pure business partner for us um, and we want to be a business partner for you. So we start to have conversations about what is it that's important to you and how does it marry with where we are looking at for the McDonald's business. We actually only sponsor one athlete. Most people think that McDonald's has a lot of athletes that we sponsor and that's Bubba Wallace. We did not just start sponsoring Bubba Wallace. We've been doing Bubba Wallace since the beginning of time because we saw something in him as being a young kid coming into the racing industry who just needed support. Like he needed support so that he could get to the next level and we decided that we wanted to stand up and support him. So then when you did have George Floyd that happened and he had the Black Lives Matter t-shirt on, it wasn't us as a brand calling and saying, we're glad you did that. Our call to him was, how can we support you? And it was easy for us to make that call because he had established what his priorities were. We knew where he was coming from with his family, what he was trying to do long term, and we understood what was bothering him. So when we made the call to him, it was more about how can we support you because what you're speaking about marries up with the values that we have within our company. So that's how we look at it, is how do we make sure that we're partnering with individuals, the human side of them. Mm. Um, yes, you may mm. be an athlete who plays basketball or who drives a race car, but it's more about the human side and then making sure that what they stand for and their values are something that is human in all of us and that we can support within the McDonald's organization. And there's one other thing that we do um, that also goes into the process piece. We have an, or we have an entity called um, the McDonald's All-American Game. Mm. It's a high school basketball game. Top 48 players in the United States um, get chosen to be this in this game and they wear a badge of honor. As part of becoming a member of that game, we actually introduce them into ways that they can volunteer within their community because we want to expose that, them to that at an early age so then they can take that on. We're not asking for them to volunteer for McDonald's or to get into the community for McDonald's. We are purely just showing them what's going on in the community and demonstrating ways that they can give back on their own so that when they go on and become you know, bigger athletes, they've already established a pattern and a foundation in which they could continue to give back. I love it. I just want to poke at one thing, growth and evolution. So you said, you know, we've partnered with Bubba Wallace for a while now, and we partner with these uh, kids, we'll call them kids, the students, the scholars in high school, and as they grow. Is there an evolution for you? Is there an evolution for him? And what does that feel like in change as you grow together? Do you have any context for us on that? Because life is all about evolution. We're surrounded by swirling change. It'd be great to get your perspective. Definitely there's evolution. I think about when I was 25 years old, five years ago. 
and what was important to me then. And you were and sneaking it, me it, in because exactly. I wasn't 21 it, yet. Exactly. I had the fake ID. <laughs> okay. Um, I but, remember that. But I, you think about your own self. You've changed over the course of time. So when you are dealing with a, a partners, they change and grow. And things that were important to them when they were younger, it may have changed. Like Bubba just announced that he's having a kid. He's having a little baby. So his life and where he is in his life stage is going to change. And so how do we make sure that we understand where he is so that we can, we can grow with him as he's growing. So the evolution has come from the fact that we were purely looking at him as a race car driver and what he wanted to do on the track. And as we started to grow with him, he started to establish like Bubba's Backyard Party, where he would go into different communities and he would say, I want to bring racing to um, an underrepresented community. So then we started to partner with him in that area because it allowed us to still evolve with him as he was evolving his brand to be in a place that was important for him. I love that. I love that. So the conversation is about the role of athletes, content brands, and social change. All right. Look who's sitting next to me. Thank goodness we have an expert in that. Um, you know, none of what we've talked about matters or is worth sharing or saying if it really doesn't educate, entertain, and empower. Now that's my opinion. Um, we take good narratives and messaging and weave a holistic story together to do that. And again, not easy. That's why I picked these people because they're so darn smart and good at what they do. So Trace, I, I would love for you to talk to us a little bit about that meeting of messaging, the content, but the good work, the fact that you have that North Star and anchor, right? There are some people out there, and I'm not one to judge someone's content, but different kind of work, different kind of work. You are really out here with a North Star, you're pushing it, and it's, you're certainly pushing it when it comes to athlete sports, these kinds of topics. How do you do it? What's the thought process? Where does it come from? Well, I love some of what all of what Gina and Liz have laid out because you mentioned two really important things. One is the relationship, right? And, you know, I talk a lot, we, we talk inside of our team because there are lots of companies uh, who do influencer work or work with celebrities. But the relational piece of it is so important because it is the thing that will make someone want to continue to, like, do this work, right? We talk about it as this sort of ladder of engagement, and you just talked about it. Like, he is now a dad. He's a race car driver who's now a dad. His life has changed. He's going up a different ring of the ladder. And so our ability to think about that, because we all, whether you're a brand or you're an organization that is doing work around issue engagement, we all know what the thing is. We want them to send the tweet about the thing and it's like well you have to step back and actually look at them as a whole person and once you do that and build that relationship they're going to go along on the ride and they're going to allow you to go on their ride too so that part I think is is really important the other thing that we um, really focus on is allowing them to be the driver right at the end of the day it's like send this information, send this tweet, and it's like, no, they have to say it in their own words. They have to be able to bring their own lived experience to the conversation because ultimately their audience, their community want to hear it from their authentic way. So we can't message folks because it has become so challenging, particularly in the sort of politically charged environment that we find ourselves in. Uh, in the U.S. for folk to feel comfortable speaking out on issues when it feels so highly charged, particularly with cancel culture. And we hear a lot of that, mm -hmm. like their hesitation of wanting to engage, particularly on politics. And it's why this sort of issue gateway is so important. We want to talk about parents. We want to talk about affordable child care. There's a gateway to talk about how they can actually, you know, be spokespeople around issues that are impacting their community. So it's important to be able to build the relationship, to understand what they care about, to actually create a North Star, and then that narrative and messaging that they're going to feel comfortable with. So if somebody comes at them in the comments or at an event, that they can stand flat-footed, right, um, and be proud about it because it is from their lived experience and not something that we have packaged up for them to sell, if that makes sense. I love that. I, I want to poke at one thing because I would be extraordinarily remiss if I didn't. We're here, we're talking about the power of, the social power of connecting athletes and content and what that means. But we also know you and your entity have 
an absolute foothold in the world of politics. And I don't know, this may be news to some people, it's an election year, I found out two days ago, who knew? It's not been in the news, no one has talked about it. I, one would think that there would be more swirling around this. Um, do you wanna take a minute, I, I don't wanna shift us too much, but there is so much co association and connective tissue between what we're going through as a country, what's happening in a year of politics, and s athletes and others of note who want to have a voice and lean into you to build and create those right narratives. Um, I'd love to hear you just tell everyone a little bit about that piece of your work sure. and maybe an example that brings us back to today's conversation. Sure. So one example that I can give, we've been working with a host of storytellers um, who do film and television. Um, there was one documentary um, called When Claude Got Shot that's about gun violence. It chronicles a, a, a guy named Claude. He went home to Milwaukee uh, to his class reunion and ended up a victim of gun violence. Uh, and so the film, which is an Emmy Award winning documentary, chronicles his experience. And what we decided to do was partner with the NBA to do what we call courtside conversations. Uh, and it was us going to communities. We, the, the panel talks about play, and play is really important when you're talking about athletes because our ability to actually engage in play helps to open up a whole world to actually have dialogue and conversation about really hard And I, I just want to ask, when you when you say play, do you mean their actual play I on the court? I mean, like, play, play. Okay, yeah, I just <laughs> like, I want to make like sure. Like, not shut up and dribble, like, dribble, dribble, right? Yep. Um, and so we constructed the conversations around play in the courts, and then we had athletes actually talking to young people about the issues around gun violence, what it means to actually develop policies in their community to actually prevent violence, and what it means for them to be advocates around ensuring that they are not involved in gun violence in their community. And so it's a gateway to talk about issues that are highly charged, right, mm -hmm. when we're talking about gun violence, a big political issue, but a way to allow uh, athletes who may not want to talk about the big P politics, but the little P politics, and, a, and an opportunity oh, to I bring like, those Oh, I like, can you say that for us one more time? Not not capital P, but little P, little All P right. politics, All right. because it is a, it's a gateway drug for them. Them, uh, to see themselves as um, ambassadors um, around these issues in a moment where they are, you know, sort of dipping their toe into whether or not they want to be, you know, LeBron James is going to wear a shirt, right? Right. He's got enough cover. Other uh, athletes may not feel like they have uh, enough uh, capacity or support, as we talk about, to, you know, really be uh, spokespeople for uh, issues in that way. And so we provide them with that support, the sort of hand-holding. We're in the comment sections with them, um, you know, sort of fighting the trolls who may have, you know, thoughts um, about them being vocal around these issues. And so it's really important for us to create a safe space for folks who want to utilize their platforms uh, for social good. And that, we believe, has been one of the reasons why we've been so successful. And be a resource. It's that's that right. you're, you're literally right. there in their right. social with them. That's amazing. Literally. That's amazing. very boutique support. So I, I, be, I kind of felt like that uh, the A-list in Infillion, and again, thank you, Infillion, I know where you folks are, but thank you, thank you, thank you for this, um, invited us all here, certainly because we've got this kind of conversation going about athleticism. I, I know I got here, I come from a family of athletes. My dad played for the Lion, my uncle Go played Lion. for the Browns, my cousin played for the Cavs, his son played for the Lakers. I'm a state champion field hockey player. I like to hit people with sticks. So this was definitely the right kind of panel for all of us, but we gotta bring it home, right? We're here, we're all here in Cannes. It's not just rosé and fun times. We wanna bring it home. And I think a big part of that is understanding that making sure when we understand who that athlete is or the conversation, the partner, we're not going to say talent, the partner, who marries with the brand and why did they do it and is it a good fit and what conversation are they having? We've gone through this journey from talent to partner to message. So what? What happened at the end? What happened at the end? What did we deliver? 
You've been wondering why Navarro was here. I was wondering for a minute too, but that's, I'm glad. <laughs> bring us home, Marissa, bring us home. And literally it says on my page, bring us home, Navarro, bring us home. Really, I, I would love for you, because this is where you excel and Mira Digital excels, can you talk to us a little bit about how we can measure, what metrics we could use? Because we could do all this good work, and if someone looks at it as a failure, we'll never be able to do it again, and that's a shame. What, what should we be looking at in terms of milestones and benchmarks as we move forward, whether it be through media, social numbers, these kinds of things? I think it's really important. Yeah, look, I think the, the beauty of where we are from a time perspective is that all the, the measurement and mechanisms already exist to align success. That's the first thing. So the, for us, and particularly, uh, you know, I'm going to athletes in general, but I'm going to go into multicultural athletes, right? Historically, multicultural athletes have higher organic engagement on social media than any other athlete because they've grown up with these devices and they communicate on a regular basis. And, you know, I knew you were going to ask me this question, so I looked up a campaign that we just did with the American Red Cross, and we had Javon Holland, who talked about how he grew up through his NFL career dealing with sickle cell. The whole campaign was wow. connecting people who were either affected by sickle cell or experienced it. And the campaign was eight months ago. You want to know when the most recent comment was? An hour and a half ago. How about so that? So the reality is from an engagement perspective and how we look at it, we look at two key stakeholders. So if you're a brand or agency in here, you need to understand the power of unearned media by connecting with an athlete who can authentically tell the story related to your brand or cause, right? If you are a creator or a publisher, you need to understand the value of that unearned income. I was talking to Gina about this. I was at the Meta presentation yesterday and they had Paris Hilton DJ, right? And people are like, well, why do they have Paris Hilton DJ? I'm like, she's an okay DJ, but what happened is the moment she walked out, everyone took out their phones and everyone get hashtag meta, hashtag all the different things. So the value of that earned earned media was significantly higher than whether she DJed or not. Tomorrow, no you mean like the people taking photos, the paparazzi taking photos of oh, this panel uh, right now, that, kind of that, like okay, that. Yes, kind of like I'm the, here. yes, okay, I'm here. okay, okay. So okay. the value in that and the challenge we have is what we find is a lot of our multicultural creators don't understand their power. You, have, you, have, you may have the 12th or 13th guy on the bench, but he has 300,000 300, followers on his social media, but he's not creating posts because he's not the top guy or gal on their team. So we have to help educate them in the power of that earner in media and to operate the same way that a Paris Hilton does so that they can extend that value. So the measurement is engagement, organic engagement. And most of our campaigns, we don't have to leverage paid if we're using an athlete because they give us that organic reach. But the key is, and I heard this earlier from my colleagues here, it's authenticity. It's connecting someone who authentically can tell you that story in the right way and then letting them amplify and do what they do best. So that's the value. It's how do you leverage organic impressions? How do you see growth and engagement? And if you go back historically, even I'm sure in a lot of the McDonald's campaigns, when they've done that the right way, they're still getting value in those campaigns today. And that's a very great opportunity. I also think, like, I love the metrics. Like, yay, double click on the metrics. Particularly when we're talking about people of color, though, the qualitative mm -hmm. metrics are mm -hmm. just as important, too, Get because, it. It, you know, those are the things that keep our folks coming back. And so how do we get our friends who are approving budgets to appreciate qualitative metrics in the same way is an ongoing you know, issue that I think that everyone has. But how we think about, you know, the, the Paris Hilton example, I think, is a great one. Like, what it looks like when that 300,000 yeah. person, like the qualitative metrics that come out of that that make you want to invest in them in the same way that you would a LeBron is a challenge. But they are oftentimes the ones who are also not as afraid to stand up around social issues. Yeah. That's um, right. That's and right. so it's really important for us to invest in that pipeline, that ladder that I talked about, so that yeah. we can push more folks out to feel more comfortable to, to lead on these issues. Navarro, do you at Mirror Digital, because I, I know the answer, so I'm, yeah. look, softball. Yeah. You at Mirror Digital, you guys have, because this was kind of my part too, the tools and resources that are proprietary to your entity. And not all of them, this was her softball to you too, are based on the quantitative. You all have been in development of some yep. qualitative tools yep. and resources. I don't want to get too in your confidential business, right. but business, but can you give just a little taste of some of what that is? Because I think it's interesting 
and unique to you. Yeah, so, so we do a couple things. One is in, in, in almost every report that we give to our brands, which is called a wrap report, we do highlight the qualitative metrics, right? We show them specific examples of the comments and the interactions and the brand resonance with that. The other thing we do, and what's typically challenging in multicultural is this whole concept of brand safety, right? So what we've done is we, we've partnered with the leading brand safety measurement tool so that we can go to that brand. That's how you demystify the qualitative, is saying, look, we can show you that these athletes are brand safe in the same way the mainstream athletes are, and then we can tie that with the qualitative resonance that they're able to achieve that the mainstream can't. Because the difference is, you know, in, in our community, we connect with all the athletes, right? Yeah. We don't just connect with the top athlete. So there's a different level of conversation. You know, we, we use the term, you know, niche creators, niche creators. But in the athletes, even the, the 11th person is still in the league. They still have access to things that other people can't. So we bring that up from a qualitative perspective, and then we marry that to show they, they're brand safe. They create organic engagement. And that unique mirror mix of data allows you to go back to your bosses and your boss's bosses and say, this is why we're doing it. And the last piece I'll say is what happens a lot in multicultural media is we're very emotionally driven. So something bad happens, they're like, hey, here, give us some money. What we work to do is when that goes away, when we start to forget we have short-term <laughs> memory, how do we have the data? How do we have the qualitative metrics to deliver that ROI regardless of the social sentiment of the culture? I love that. I love so, that. So, Marissa, I have another softball. Get in for there. Get tomorrow. in there. I um, love it. Talking about multicultural, um, talking about metrics, you talked about Javon's post and someone interacted yesterday with his post about sickle cell when that campaign was eight months old. Tomorrow is World Sickle Cell Awareness Day. So my guess is that you will probably see more engagement and more that? qualitative metrics, and that will resonate eight months later because tomorrow is a huge day in the sickle cell community for him. Well, and, and, yeah. and if we're talking about sickle cell and we're here to talk about people of color, we should know that there has now been some groundbreaking new drugs as of recently that are changing the game for the first time ever. Not decades or years ever in the world of sickle cell and it gives a glimmering hope of uh, survival and life, being able to live for people who have had this terrible, terrible disease who exclusively look and sound like us for all time. So this is a, that was a wonderful point. So thank you for that. I it's appreciate that. It's also a good example of how evergreen content That's right, right. is the gift that keeps giving. So I, I, I love that. I'm going to go find the post I mean, and, share. and this So it, it really brings us home. We came here to learn about, to talk about, to get engaged around, you know, talking about athletes, talking about social uh, change and social good and how athletes through content and messaging can help us achieve that. We began with the athletes themselves, recognizing that it's not a one-way street, that we need to listen to what they're saying. We move to the athletes with the brands. What are the brands looking for? What does an authentic and evolving relationship look like? And what are you gonna say? How do we, we don't just put words in their mouth, we draw their words from them. We don't shove words to them, we pull the words they want to say out. And that makes it authentic, it builds on what they've talked about, and then that's when we get to that right qualitative and quantitative measurement. And I think that really takes us through the journey of what we came to talk about, and I, I mean, I just thought that was amazing. Before we go, I'd love, we've got a little bit of time, I'd love each of you to just take two minutes and crow about something. You've each talked about a few case studies, but y'all are doing some bad and eh, eh. Can you just take a few minutes and crow about one thing that you are working on that is going to blow our mind? So I'll, I'll go back to the point that I made earlier, and I'll talk about one thing that we as the PA did that hopefully blew everyone's mind. And the point that I made earlier um, was about listening to the athlete. And one of the things that we did as an organization a couple years ago is when um, our athletes were not being heard, we created our own platform to tell our own story. So again, um, our athletes have always been involved in social justice, um, community issues. Uh, they've been activists, but again, we no one heard them until we were at the height of some very trying times. So um, 
what we did um, right when the kneeling and the anthem, we monetized that. We worked with one of our executive committee members. We created a t-shirt for all of our players to wear. We licensed his product and created royalty sales off of it. We got all of our players to wear it on the same game day. We did a unifying message prior to the game. And we, again, we made money for the players, amplifying their voices. And then what we also did is we created a narrative that we pushed out on social media, YouTube. You can search it. It's called The Narrative where we invited at least 25 players to tell their own stories mm. about what they were doing in the area of social activism, community, and philanthropy. So again, it's called The Narrative, and when we couldn't get anyone to push out our players' stories, we created our own platform and pushed it out for them. That's So you're more than a sociologist, That's anthropologist, right. you're family. That's right. That's what family, family does. Yes. You fam, fam. Yes. <laughs> Damn. I'm auntie. Auntie. <laughs> auntie. Come on with it, auntie. That is something to crow about. Liz, what you going to crow about? Um, we are getting ready to reinvent a national platform that we have that is around our athletes, that we, our future athletes that are coming up. Um, and the way that we're doing it is that we're actually allowing their voice to be heard. And we're going to focus on making sure that we have gender diversity as well. Because so much of this has been focused on men, and we're, look, we're working on how do we bring the female voice front and center and make sure that they are getting the same amount of equity as the, as the men are. Oh, I'll I love leave it that. at that. Okay, okay. Ooh, ooh. She's like, I can't say too much. <laughs> can't say too much. I think what we got is pretty powerful. I love that. What you got, Trace? Well, we talked about the election. As we think about civic engagement, we know that one of the audiences that are that is most coveted this election cycle is black men. They're often, always, the most overlooked audience as well. So we've been doing quite a bit of work and looking at major metropolitan areas where we're really focusing on engaging black men this election cycle, but doing it through the lens of issues, the issues that they care about. Many of them care about economic mobility and security. Um, many of them care about child care. So what are the issues that often over, um, oftentimes get overlooked when we're talking about this demographic? Uh, and working really closely with a community of social media influencers from food to fashion to sports to gaming to also get in on it because they also have conversations with this demo consistently. So we're coming at it from a different perspective, not, not your mama's uh -huh, civic engagement uh -oh, campaign. Uh -oh. It's your aunties? Is it aunties? Is it TT? It's TT. All right now. I love all that. Crow, 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 crow. Navarro, would you like to bring us home? I'll bring us home. Um, I won't give any specific details. I was looking for my boss, the CEO, to get okay, and she's not here. She's petite, but she still makes me nervous. So I don't cross her unless she gives me approval. So uh, I'll tell you where we're going by telling you why I'm here. So before I was at Mirror. I spent two years at Meta leading product marketing for the creator segment on Facebook. And one of the gaps and things that I saw was that um, multicultural creators, and that's whether they're influencers, website publishers, etc., were at a deficit related to having access and having knowledge about how to leverage current technologies. So what Mirror, what we're doing and what we're launching over the next couple of months is a suite of tools to level up multicultural publishers and creators so that they can compete with their mainstream counterparts and we're doing that at no cost to them. So mm. we're gonna give mm. them the tools to level them up, and then we're gonna go to their brands and agencies and give them through measurement to show them that they can partner with these people. So that's coming out really soon, and I'm really excited about it. I love, uh, and interestingly enough, each of you, what you crowed about, you crowed about the measurement, you crowed about the messaging, you crowed about your brand affiliation, and you crowed about the athletes taking care of it. I did a good job with my narrative. <laughs> And I'm happy I was sitting here. Let's thank these people. Let's thank Infilion. And let's thank the A-list. Thank you all so much for coming. This was a wonderful, and now it's happy hour. Thank you.